Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Powell with Corona Rising Surviving Now, Episode 8. And today we are going to be talking about a very interesting topic, looking at the way that uh, youth who are in Kenya are rising up to demand justice for youth who are being discriminated against. In fact, an entire community that's being discriminated against uh, based on its ethnic background. And so I really think it's important to, to draw attention to not only what's happening here in the United States where we're recording this episode, but how young people around, uh, around the world are really shaping and changing their own civil rights movements and calling out injustice on a corporate level, on a government level, and even on a police level. So the title of this episode is Closer to Home, Closer to Home Than We Think, Youth Dying to Ethnic Discrimination in Kenya. And this topic is really personal uh, for our team here at Corona Rising uh, because one of our team members, Fetcha, is actually from the community in which four young people were brutally murdered. Uh, and to, to my knowledge, those, those murders are uh, some of, of very many uh, murders, including that of children. And it's not just impacting those who are murdered, but impacting and terrorizing an entire community and displacing disproportionately women and girls who then are at risk for other forms of exploitation, brutality, and violence. And so there's that ripple effect. And these young people and these amazing people who are joining us today are pushing ag back against that tide of violence and saying enough is enough. And so we want to hear from them today. I'm going to pass the baton over to my colleague, Fetcha, to help us introduce our lovely guests because I want to make sure that they're introduced properly. So take it away, Fetcha. <laughs> Hi, it's Fetcha here with Corona Rising. I'm a co-founder and director of Artistic Services. Um, and today we are joined by uh, Abdikarit Kurewa. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself after, but I'll just go through the names. Uh, we have Abdikarit Kurewa, uh, Basile, Stephen, Stephen Basile, sorry, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Pantoren, uh, and we have Adan Wano. Um, so I will just let Abdi uh, introduce himself now and we'll go from there. I think he's muted. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my bad. Um, so my name is Abdikari Kurewa. I'm, I'm a researcher at the Cultural Heritage Department of the National Museums of Kenya. I also come from the Rendile community. Um, I'm an archaeologist by training. So I've worked around the region and, um, and I'm happy to share my experiences of um, what is ongoing now and a bit of the past, just to give it a, uh, some context. And yeah, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, now we'll have, um, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> we'll have Dr. Uh, Pandoran introduce herself. Uh, Hi start. everyone, um, I'm Elizabeth um, Amarindile. Um, I mean the oldest among all of you. <laughs> and um, a mother to the group um, and, and basically um, a social scientist and, and also um, have experience in terms of environmental management. Uh, so basically, that's what I do. We're so uh, glad you're here and so honored uh, you could join us today. Um, Steven Vassella, are you there? <laughs> yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Steven Vassella. Uh, I'm a software engineer by profession, a human rights activist, I would call myself, or a human rights defender and a social activist. Uh, from the Rendila community, and I'm um, joining you from uh, Ngurunit in northern Kenya. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us, too. Um, Aden, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm Aden Wano from Marsabit, Rendila by tribe. I mean, environmental sciences at the moment, but I'm in the field of agribusiness, export of fruits and vegetables. Pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you. Great. Um, that's it. So I'll just pass it on to Andrea. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I just want to kick right into to the questions. Fetcha, I'm going to start with you. Um, what inspired you to 
to start a petition demanding justice for these four students. Give us a bit of background about what's happened and, and then what led up to the petition. Um, so I actually uh, will probably just talk about the petition for now and I think our guests have more info of exactly what happened. Um, but I was just, uh, this is not just any other trend uh, going on, but um, you know, it's been like something that everyone just is just starting petitions and all that. But this is so dear to me, um, being written by myself and just tired of losing people that I love and care about uh, with no justice at all uh, and no arrest made. Um, so that kind of inspired me to speak up. And also, uh, first of all, I'm not home, so I can't join the product. So that was also another thing. Um, to be able to give people from my tribe a voice who are not there. So we are, um, I'll say there is a great number of us who are not back home. We're either stuck in Nairobi because of the corona uh, pandemic, uh, but also who are far away from home in other continents and stuff. So we are able to raise our voices in that way. Um, and also um, I'll say it's, it's just it's just time for us to sit down and actually talk about this serious conversations you know it doesn't matter where you are um, but it's time uh, it's time to talk about you know talk about the main uh, things uh, that have been affecting our community especially being minority and really marginalized um, and we basically don't have a voice and representation matters and that is why we need support from all our listeners, uh, if you're listening to this, uh, I really urge you to sign this petition uh, and help us demand justice uh, for this for innocent kids. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really, you know, it's it's really so important, Fetcha, for for our audience to understand that these four university students um, had very bright futures uh, and were themselves working for a better life for for their larger community. Uh, Abdi, I was wondering if you could give us a very short kind of history of the conflict, like what led up to to this moment where these four amazing students were were murdered. Has to unmute uh, Abdi, where are you? I'm right here. Um, so, um, my context will go deeper a bit, and uh, I would like to start. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'd like to start with the evidence of conflict in Masabit that goes way into the prehistoric times. Uh, 10,000 years ago, there was a lady who was shot and killed by an arrow. Um, uh, you know, and uh, we have that evidence. So like that is going way back. And what I'm trying to say is conflict has always been in that part of the country. Because it's a very important, um, it's where actually pastoralism started in East um, in East, uh, the fastest place where uh, pastoralism started south of the Sahara. And, you know, so it is a very, in, in, it's a very important place. And the Rindili are one of the indigenous communities there. Uh, they actually believe they have sites where they are round, uh, ring of stones and they believe their ancestors came from there. So they are the most in, uh, people who can claim indigeneity to most of it. Um, well, in the historic times as well, they had uh, conflicts with the Borana on one side. Um, because the Boranas, um, as you know, come, most of them come from Ethiopia. And that's where they have a whole kingdom. Actually, they are, they are a whole civilization. And what they believe, Borana is not only, Borana is an identity uh, that comes along by you believing in their king. So they, they, they were asking for allegiances. They were raiding um, um, Rendiles using horses. And, and the British colonial government had to intervene and um, put restrictions on ownership of horses. So like it goes way, way, way back. Uh, but what we're experiencing now um, is different because um, I will bring you more closer to 2010 when we had a new constitution that um, allowed for devolved governance and Massabit was one of the counties and actually is the one, most of the diverse uh, county in terms of cultural diversity. We have more than 15 communities and uh, the fact that the Rendiles are the only uh, the Rendiles and the Elmolos are the only indigenous communities, um, the Rendiles were pushed um, uh, further, and because they are the second largest in terms of population, 
um, and they are in between two warring communities, that is the Borana and the Gabra, they play a very important role politically. And uh, since they are the, the most determinant, uh, the other communities are willing to use um, any force possible, whether terror, whether, whether you know, economic subjugation, just to make sure that the Rendilas keep on supporting them towards the bid for governorship and therefore the power uh, that comes along with it. So, and uh, what we are seeing actually from 1994, uh, that's when first, the first killing started. And up to now we have 204 Rendilas who have been killed. Uh, and the most painful one and the most uh, tragic is uh, the case that we are actually looking into, the killing of four university students who had promising futures ahead of them, whose parents have you know, fought so hard and we know the level of economic uh, empowerment for women especially who are you know, sometimes the breadwinners um, uh, in their families, you know, how, how hard uh, they, they face that kind of uh, poverty and how much they strive and sacrifice to make sure their kids go to school. So it was a very um, disheartening uh, situation. And uh, yeah, that's where we are. So what I'm basically saying is before, people used to fight for pasture and water, but now uh, people are fighting for uh, positionality in politics because that's where also resources come from. So we have this historical um, underlying uh, conflict that has been ongoing and the enmity between this and that tribe and therefore, since we are looking at economy as the new resource, uh, you know, the war is uh, still taking uh, the, 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 the ethnic aspect still. So it's very, it's very heavy and very emotive. So I hope uh, that uh, gives you That's a background. Very helpful. Thank you. And I think, you know, I, what, some of the things that I'm hearing, you know, in my mind is, is someone who's I'm sadly uh, not able to visit Kenya right now, but um, but when I when I saw the stories when Fetcha alerted me to what happened with the students, I was I was immediately thinking about the fact that you know these these young people have, have risen up with the support of their community as well as their families to to be able to overcome a lot of incredible hardships and that reminded me of so many young people I know here in in the Washington D.C. area. Many of you may not know, but Washington D.C. has the most uh, the highest rate of childhood poverty in the country. Uh, and over half of the kids are, are going to school every day without breakfast. Uh, we have double the rate of poverty than, uh, than the national average. And so and many of the young survivors we work with have also dealt with a lot of hardship in their family. And many of them have lost fathers due to gun violence or mothers due to, to similar things. So it really struck me that these, these students were on the cusp of such something so amazing with their lives and we're already contributing such powerful things to their community and then to have them just snatched away with, with really no rhyme or reason. Um, Basel, I, I read some, some of your stories about, um, about what you knew of the students and I was just hoping that, that you could share that because uh, you know, you're really, you've really got an amazing connection to, to these four young people. So if you don't mind, Basel, please share a little bit more about what you knew of them. Ethan Baselli. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And uh, I personally have known all the four victims, uh, some for quite a long time, others for a few years. Uh, I'll start with Jessica. Jessica, I knew her from last year, uh, in actually November, August last year, when she approached me with leaders of uh, the Rendile University Student Association to help them organize the event. And uh, one thing that struck me was how she, apart from her ambition, how much she loved the community and really wanted to give back to the society. She's, during that time, she always, she would call asking for, you know, uh, all sorts of, yeah, Jessica, all sorts of help for the community. She would. She would, she's, I would say she would spend quite a lot of time trying to see how the community could be helped. And being a, actually a third year university student, almost done with university, uh, and her life being you know, uh, brutally terminated, struck me so hard. Uh, Dan, Dan Lantare, a 17 year old a high school student, I got to know him from when he, way back when he was. I think about nine years old uh, as a baby. And uh, after my high school education, uh, I 
went to live in Marsabit with their family. Uh, and I loved computers back then. I still love working with computers. And and he would always uh, come to me. Yeah, you know, they nicknamed me Uncle Computer. You know, Uncle Computer, I want to see how we can play this game and this and all that. And he's a really hardworking young boy. Uh, you know, in may his soul rest in peace. Struggling. Uh, also in education, uh, coming from not a well-off family also. Yeah, it's it's so sad because this is a future for a community that has been just ended by bandits, bullets from such barbaric people. Uh, the other one, uh, uh, Peter Obele, not Peter, but George Obele. Most people have written that Peter about Peter, but it's George. George Obele uh, happened to have attended the same high school I was in. Uh, about uh, four years after I, I was there. And uh, a brief history of the school. Uh, Kisima in, uh, is a school that offers help and scholarship to uh, students from needy communities, very needy, those who cannot otherwise afford to pay school fees. So uh, George was a beneficiary of that because he comes from a very needy background. And going through school, four years of high school, exemplary performance. He was one of the best students in his class. And then joining university. He was a fourth year university student, not actually a first year. He was a fourth year university student, almost done with his education, uh, being a teacher of mathematics and geography. So these are people I know on a personal level. Uh, I have met uh, Chuchu, Obele, uh, Chuchu uh, Mosor, I think on two or three occasions. He's the one I least know about, but I have met him. I know he's a struggling young man. He used to ride a, a motorbike in town to earn a living. So these are people who otherwise would have been a bright future for this community. These are people who who's, uh, put quite a lot of effort to ensure that their families would come out of poverty. But now, they are the hope of their families. You know, their relatives depended on them. They have put quite a lot of resources and effort into educating them. A lot that has gone into ensuring that they attained uh, their education. But now, they are not with us. They have been, their lives have been terminated by, you know, uh, bullets of people who don't care. And uh, I love the way Abdukadir Guto gave a, a background of the conflict in Marsabit. And conflict in Marsabit has been not only, uh, it used to be because of uh, land and land-based resources. And the area, uh, Songa, where the four come from is actually the communities. Also, uh, Post 2010, uh, the new constitution of Kenya, uh, devolution has brought into place new conflicts, uh, conflicts arising from power, power of power and politics of power. Everyone wants to, you know, to be in that top seat, uh, the gubernatorial seat, the governor. Every, every tribe wants that share. And Rendile community has been put in the middle of all this quagmire between these communities. So that it's on. Fortunate and the youth, it's time for the youth to stand up. Uh, I love the way uh, after the conflict, we all came together trying to ensure that justice is served. And youth are the voices that can be heard. They have the, the strength, they have the power, they have the skills, and they have the energy. Yes, thank, I, you. I, thank you so much. And I, you know, I, I agree that, that this is a time when, when the younger generations have the tools and the and the, the resources to to rise up collectively, and that that really hits me in a, in a strong way because I I've personally been involved in youth activism uh, since I was in college, and and I shared with Fetcha that uh, the first actions that I ever took actually was organizing for care for uh, for young people who were homeless in Mombasa. I never got to go to Mombasa, but I was helping. Uh, it, from the United States, writing grants and, and raising money and trying to support my colleagues there. Um, and that's where I learned a lot about 
the experiences of, of young people who are homeless and in different parts of Kenya and it really stayed with me but I I think now it's time to bring those who are organizing for for justice and and racial equality and change here in the United States together with uh, what you're doing there because the more that we can be globally connected the bigger change that, that we can have and I was thinking about even just connections I have to people who might know someone in Kenya who can have an influence and you know I think there's there's ways to contribute um, Aden I, I wanted to ask you uh, next uh, a special question and and just get your perspective um, on on really you know what you know but do you see a commonality between the demands to reform the police in America and, and the demands and, and what young people are asking for in terms of reform there in your community in Kenya. Okay, thank you. I don't know whether you are, you can get me clearly. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, first of all, I really wish to thank all of you for coming together really just to demand for some justice for our young youth who are kids innocently. But actually, just to take you briefly, I personally have attended about 25 burials said, with the same cases of killing, whereby you find somebody actually, just because now you are from this tribe here, somebody comes along that route that you are using, you are shot, and the killers are never found. We really actually to raise this issue with the security personnel that one or two actually was the update actually on this case? Because normally after a week, after the case actually goes quiet completely. And there's no follow-up actually. But now as youth actually, what we are demanding actually with the killing of our youth here, we are saying this one should be the last actually. Because now we really want to put pressure on security apparatus back at home that they should find Actually, couple because the more we keep quiet, actually, as youth, the more we are going to bury our people. This is not actually the first thing we live last. And normally, actually, spikes, actually, the trend that we have been seeing two years when elections are nearing, this trend actually now, the trend actually, the killing actually normally goes up. And it's mostly political because now, after the killing, we can't really tell which community actually has committed the crime. Because we are being turned actually to pull actually to one or the other because no one community can, can lead on its own within the county. There must be action of tribes actually which come together. But now as Rendilia community, we are being actually put together. When these things happen, we, we normally ask ourselves who has done this thing. We don't have any killians at the moment. As youth now, actually, we are putting pressure on the security operators back at home that we need. We are, and we are demanding actually for some answers because the more we keep quiet, these this cases actually will rise up. Because actually now with this killing, actually, we are really hoping that things will cool, but the report that we are hearing from home back there, things are not that good. And unless unless actually some perpetrators are arrested. We really don't see actually any hope actually in the security forces until and when actually now when they come back down to hear our, our cries. Because as we are speaking now, there's a mother who is crying somewhere that she has lost her daughter. You know actually when you lose a daughter that you feel actually struggle actually up to that day in the university, up to that day, and then somebody just comes within a fraction of a second, she's gone. And then we are here mourning, we cry, we bite, and then we forget actually. What we are really actually asking from this killing that we must get some answers. And we are, as you actually, we are not going to rest. It's only that this corona actually has actually put some restrictions. We're actually demanding also for us who are in Nairobi, actually to take this case forward actually, even to the ministry. So that we can get actually some answers because this is not the first killing that has taken place. Right. There's there's more than two hundred from what I understand. And you know, it, I first of all I want to thank you for joining. I know that you know we're speaking about organizing, we're speaking about justice. 
we're talking about reform, but at the heart of all this is, is deep-rooted mourning and loss for those who were just so senselessly taken from, from your community. So I want to thank you for being willing to share and join uh, when I know this impacts all of you uh, so personally. Um, Dr. Pantorin, I, I wanted to, to reach out to you next. Um, you have such an amazing background as the only woman PhD holder among the Rindell community. Um, I feel like you should write a book <laughs> about your life so that I can read it. Um, but um, but I, I wanted to ask you, how does this conflict, um, how does it impact in particular women and girls in, in your community? And again, that question is not to, to put over emphasis on, on one gender or the other, but I, I do think there are some distinctions and there are some differences in how this type of unrest impacts women and girls in the Rindle community. So if you could speak to that, it would be very, very meaningful. Okay, Andrea, I think uh, it is common knowledge that um, women in, in many uh, war-related um, situations are mostly the most vulnerable. And, and, and it's because um, when men go to fight, um, women are left with children. Um, and in that situation, they are not able to defend themselves. In this particular case, you, you realize that it's a girl among the four men that were killed, young men that were killed. It's the girl that was, um, I think, according to some information that we are gathering, um, the girl was targeted. Um, and we don't know what really happened uh, in that situation. It, it's more than just meet the eye. It, it could be more of... Um, even further to raping. So there's so much information that are coming out as a result of, of that. So women generally in all situations, and, and particularly in, in a pastoral community, women um, suffer most. Uh, and how do they suffer? Women um, don't own properties. Um, women depend mostly um, on, on their male colleagues for feeding and, and all that. And so when men go to fight, they're left to feed for the children. They are also left scared all over. So there's both emotional and, and physical stress related to that. And, and women um, suffer because their children get killed. Look at the four. The four young uh, uh, kids that have been brutally killed, and may their soul rest in peace, um, have parents. And their parents have gone through many ways to be able to take care of them up to university level. And mostly you find that women are the ones that struggle to, to make sure that even girls go to school. So um, in, in our situation in Marsabit, in pastoral communities, women are mostly the most vulnerable to, to conflict of that situation. They are left at home, they are displaced uh, in, in a war area. They, they are even, um, when men die, they, they are left to, to go into prostitution to feed their families. And, and when men and their husbands die, they are left widow to feed for the families and yet they don't have properties. Uh, women are the ones that, in, in that particular community in Songa, women mostly are the ones that take uh, milk and, and, and vegetables to the market. So uh, if, if you do a, a kind of analysis of, of the number of women that have died as a result of road kills, like, like the ones that we, we, we have just experienced last week, I, I, will, I will bet that the number, the high number, of, of the victims are women. So basically, in, in all scenarios that are related to wars or conflicts, women are the most affected and, and their children. And you know, Dr. Pantorin, I, that really struck me, I, and I wanna continue for those who are going to be listening to this, to, to bring this back home also to the United States, um, where Fetcha and I are working with predominantly young women and girls who are survivors of, of human trafficking when I look back at over 1,500 young women and girls who I've personally worked with who are survivors, uh, mainly coming from, from the Washington, D.C. area, uh, I can count on my hand two fathers who were in, in their life. Uh, the other fathers were either incarcerated, so they were in, in jail, or they were killed by gun violence. Um, and it's not just that the fathers weren't there. For these young women and girls, they lost that father figure, they lost that connection. And so that's how traffickers would move in, you know, to, to play that role or pretend, you know, to play that role and then take advantage of the feelings and the loss 
as well as the fact that these young young people are then being left to be raised by a woman who is trying to raise kids, work, take her kids to school, deal with her own emotional loss and needs, um, and, and really herself a target to, to others in the community who want to take advantage of her. And then you add to that that there is a structural racism and unrest that that blankets that that work. Um, you know, another statistic in my work: and ninety-five percent of the young women and girls I serve are young women and girls of color, predominantly African American. And so you you can't separate uh, the police brutality, uh, the 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 lack of law and and order and structure to to really make sure that all communities are protected equally. You can't take that away from violence against women or away from poverty. Um, and you know, something Fetcha and I were talking about, uh, I was doing a lot of research to, to, to learn about these four young people. And most everything I found was about, about this young woman. Uh, J Jessica, is that how you say her name? Yeah, yeah. So, so, but I wanted to learn about all of all, all of the all of those students who were lost. But as I did more and more research, I did see, as you said, the vast majority of the residual loss of, of the impact of the community were the displacement of women and children um, in in the Rendell community. And I that research that I found was a little bit older, but uh, but nonetheless, I think very relevant. Um, you know, as we're coming to a close on this episode, I wanted to make to ask Fetcha um, if if you're comfortable with me sharing uh, with our listeners that there is a way for us to directly support the families uh, during this time, because as all of our guests have said, um, these families, these, this community depended on these young people as they rose up to be the bright star that they were. So their loss impacts their community and their families in a deep and profound way that uh, is often hard for those not uh, in the community to understand. So Fetcha, if, if you or, or your your cousin wanted to share how people can support directly, and we'll also add that information on the, sh on the show's website as well. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Derasa, do you wanna share about how they can contribute? Uh, but I would like to say for, if people are having a hard time, uh, listeners in the US, uh, they can demo me and I'll just pass the money along. Uh, to my team and stuff like that. Um, we'll have my Vemo account number. I mean, my Vemo ID on there um, and the podcast notes and our YouTube channel. And I'll pass the money along uh, to our WhatsApp group that we have. Um, Excellent. And I just wanted to say thank you for the youths, uh, the Rondilla youths for standing up. Um, you guys inspire me so much. So we are not letting up. Um, and please sign the petition. And we'll also have it um, in the notes, I guess, right on there. <laughs> absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's that. Please but, share. <laughs> yeah, but Dara, so you can go ahead uh, and share how like people in Kenya um, or Africa are able to support and like, um, you know, help the family if they can send an MPESA directly. Yeah, to, okay. That. Hi everybody, my name is Deraso Dohole. Uh, so technically I work with refugees and um, refugees is one of the main uh, concerns here in Africa because uh, we have a huge percentage of refugees, that's around 25%. So most of the people I've been working with are very, very vulnerable. So coming to my community, being marginalized, uh, being able to support uh, especially the four families that were affected will mean so much to us. So that's why we, we are asking uh, if you can uh, contribute because so far uh, the youth have contributed so much and I have to say I'm so proud of them because um, in less than a week we, are about, uh, we have contributed around 2,000 USD, almost to 2,000 USD. Um, and other members of the communities, especially the older generation, are coming in and are trying to contribute. And uh, with this, uh, this tragedy that happened actually has brought us so much uh, as uh, the community together. And that we are seeing so much of us coming together and vo uh, working together, volunteering to ensure that these four families are I wouldn't say well, uh, well off, but they, they 
feel the support that our community are giving uh, to them. So that's why we, we are requesting for more contribution that will be going to the families because it will mean so much to us, but more so it will mean so much to them. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I think um, I, I really like the way that you're framing it. It's not just about a financial contribution, but it's about strengthening the entire community because it is through that strength and through that organizing and through that, that love that is shining through in this moment. Uh, that is going to be what actually pushes the, the demands for justice forward. Because I think, you know, people look at demands for justice and reform on this bigger level, right? Like a global level, but, but this yeah. is very personal. This is, this is for young people and their families and the community around them. And as you spread that knowledge about what happened to them and as people contribute, we are building, building a community that is going to, to lift up all young people's voices. Um, I am going to, to close um, our conversation now, but I wanted to say thank you to our listeners for standing with us as we look at the issues that are closer to home than we think. These young people who were killed um, are, are our brothers and our sisters, no matter where they're from, and they deserve justice just like anyone else um, deserves justice. And I think now's, now's the time be, be us in Kenya or in Washington, D.C. Now is the time. And at Corner Rising, we are survivors for other survivors. And we, we will continue to work with you and, and demand that this justice be had. So thank you all for joining. And uh, I truly wish you all the very best. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye. Can you help us? We are few. We are going to go 